PRs, personal records. It's a double-edged sword. On one hand, they can propel your progress, motivate you. They're awesome to aim for. On the other hand, if you do it wrong, it cause injury, overtraining, and actually make you hate training. Today's episode, we're gonna talk about PRs, why they're awesome, why you should chase them, but how to do it the right way so you develop a balanced, injury-free, amazing physique. Good yeah, at what at what point did it change to the term PR instead of like CrossFit? How, how much you max? CrossFit. CrossFit. It was CrossFit. Yeah. They called them PRs. They popularized okay. it. Mm -hmm. I, I I like uh, PRs because when they before they were popularized, it was just about maxing, but it wasn't like mainstream to challenge yourself in that way. Right. And it is a performance based um, goal and. Although not perfect, right? Performance-based goals can also not be perfect. I prefer them over aesthetic-based goals because you can get really unhealthy chasing aesthetics or even improving, quote unquote, improving your aesthetics. You could starve yourself. You could overtrain. You could damage yourself. Hitting PRs, you could also do that, but it's a lot harder. And for most average people, you're not going to hit new PRs if you're unhealthy. So it's it's a it's better very way. objective. Yes, I mean that's it's really like it's, there's no fluff involved. There's no um, sort of interpretation behind it. It's like can you lift that weight or can you not? And you know sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't. But uh, when you start chasing it, obviously to your earlier point, like that's where there can be um, you know some challenges with that in terms of like. You, <clears throat> that could create a whole nother problem for you. Well, that's why I think this is a good discussion because I'm on the other side of PR. So in fact, I came out early on when I first hit Instagram eight plus over eight years ago. Now, uh, one of the things I, I spoke out on quite a bit was the PR culture because I wasn't a fan of it. I wasn't a fan of uh, people chasing that and focused so much on hitting that number that they were, not paying attention to form and technique as much. They were getting injured. It became a thing that, oh, if I wasn't hitting a PR, that I'm, I'm not having success in the gym. And so I actually spoke out early on about how I did not like PR culture. And so I do think there's a conversation to be had about, okay, so what does uh, healthy PR chasing look like? Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because the re because just so people don't get the wrong <clears throat> idea, the PR culture was about, uh, max, max lift. And we'll talk about that. And there's value to that too, but it can go, it can also go dark. But uh, to just to clarify, um, Adam chases PRs all the time, but he chases different kinds of PRs. Right. And this is where, this is where it can be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, this is how you can avoid the problems with chasing <laughs> the same type of PR all the time, which I think uh, we'll get into. Because if you do that, if it's always the same kind of PR, like let's say it's always uh, bench a, squat a day. max, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, you end up training uh, in an unbalanced yeah. way. You right. start to compromise joint health and integrity. You start to sacrifice certain things to chase a particular number, and then the the returns you get from it are uh, become diminishing. And that's the whole PR culture. <clears throat> but if you balance out your PRs and figure out how to set them right. Um, then it can be very powerful. In fact, it's one of the most powerful things you could do to keep yourself consistent um, with your training and to motivate yourself to, to show up and to work out and how to create you know the best uh, kind of workout. And that's, that's the important thing to do is to figure out what a good PR <coughs> protocol is and then how to mold your training around it. Yeah, I like that because I, I feel like uh, chasing a PR or just focusing on, on that and say like the main lifts is a lot like building a car you know with the most amount of horsepower just to win in the quarter mile and it's like that's great but in real life you actually have to take turns and there's and a, drive farther than a quarter yeah mile, and yeah. so in, and that's how i feel about chasing just the bench squat deadlift type of pr <clears throat> uh versus other prs in your life like a, a, you know a pr can be man I, my knee can now travel over my toe uh right four more inches than it did say two years ago that's a, a personal record mm -hmm. for me like it's i've never worked at my mobility so much that i've gained that range of motion and so i think it a healthy relationship with prs looks like a pursuit of that in different directions and things that benefit you more than just the quarter mile race. Also other aspects yeah. of your life. Now I remember when I, cause when I first became a trainer, um, a lot of what I would 
teach my clients to focus on were aesthetic goals. It was like body fat tests, uh, circumference measurements, weight, because that's what people ask for, right? When they would sign up with you. Shortly after becoming a trainer, within a few years, I realized that um, teaching my clients to aim for performance type goals was superior because oftentimes mm. in the pursuit of losing weight or circumference or even just fat percentage, people would do things that I'd have to kind of coach them through. They would compromise their health or they would starve themselves or they would overtrain. And if the scale went down, then that was good. And they would ignore all these other things. I noticed with chasing performance, uh, they, they, they couldn't get away with doing as many bad things, especially when you first get started. And the first time this really hit me was I trained a, a young lady who had just essentially come out of an eating disorder. I remember her, her parents hired me to train her cause I trained her parents and they told me, you know, she was had, had anorexia. She's kind of, she's out of it now. Her therapist suggests exercise, but the therapist also wants to talk to you. And I got on the therapist on the phone before I trained this young lady. And I said, okay, normally what I do, and I'm assuming this is a bad idea, is I test body fat and weight and that kind of stuff. I said, I'm sure that's going to be super triggering for her. And she said, oh yeah, don't, don't weigh her. Don't do any of that stuff. Don't even talk about how she looks. And I said, uh, well, what should I focus on? And she goes, just get her strong. And I remember it was like a light bulb went off for me. Like, of course, if, if she gets stronger, she has to eat enough. Yeah. She has to nourish her body. And then I saw tremendous progress. And then I remember I applied that to other clients and I said, what, <clears throat> this is such a better uh, strategy for people if you do it in the right way. And then here's the key for longevity with your training. Cause we're not interested in getting people in shape and then they get out of shape. We're not interested in teaching you how to, <clears throat> you know, build a nice physique, get healthy fit, and then you're out of it. We're interested in really getting people to do this for the rest of their life. Well, the key to that is number one, finding purpose behind your training. Otherwise, <clears throat> you know, it's going to be hard to show up. So why am I here? What's the purpose? And there's a lot of ways to do that. <clears throat> and then number two is to do it in a way to where it's uh, you have longevity. Because if the purpose is always to get a max squat, in the first three years, everything's going to go great. After that, every five pounds I add to my squat comes with exponentially higher rates of risk of injury and all that kind of stuff. And if I push it too hard, I'll get to the point where I can never squat again, you know, type of deal. So <clears throat> that's kind of what we're going to talk about is how to use this in a way to where you can benefit <clears throat> across the board and get uh, phenomenal results. Today's program giveaway, the new program, MAPS Old Time Strength. Here's how you can win it. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel uh, and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Now, everybody else, it's the final hours of the new program launch, which means you get it discounted. So if you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. That'll get you $80 off, plus you'll get two free eBooks, Forgotten Muscle and Strength Building Secrets, and Jay Campbell's Living a Fully Optimized Life. So again, click on the link at the top of the description below, or... Go to mapsoldtime.com and use the code OLD80. All right, back to the show. Well, let's first talk about why PRs are great, and then we can get to the kind of the dark stuff. I think the very first most obvious reason why a PR, setting a PR is good, is because it is a motivating uh, factor. It is very motivating to set a goal and then to see yourself moving towards that goal. I can't think of anything that, isn't more encouraging on its face than, than something like that. Yeah. To really set out on a specific target um, and to see like incremental progress with that. I mean, we obviously like there, there's part of that too. You have to pay attention to those small wins along the way that you're getting towards that goal and to not um, uh, basically to listen to your body and the signals that your body's providing as well. I think part of that too is in that we, we didn't really bring up, but there's ways of like masking other parts uh, that might not be, uh, you know, in con contributing like they should. And so now we, we, we start to get to the point where we're going to get the, you know, the wrist wraps, we're going to get the, the certain kind of aids to kind of help uh, with the stability component to get you towards further towards that goal. But for me, the ideal situation is to be able to account for all these things, work on all these things and have all of that uh, 
together simultaneously working towards that objective of i want to just get stronger at this particular lift that requires so much well yeah it's a object uh, it's an objective way to measure your success in your training um yeah whereas in the mirror is super subjective super subjective and and you could also see change in the mirror on the scale in the right direction but going about it in a very unhealthy totally. way whereas if I'm focused on a lift that I want to be get stronger in or a newfound range of motion, uh, in order for me to have success or hit PRs in, in that, those categories, uh, it's not 100%, but it's more likely that I'm doing that in a healthy way in order to to, to achieve that. Yeah, and, and here's the other thing that I discovered as a trainer. I'd love your guys' input on this. It's definitely motivating for clients to see the scale change, to see their you know clothes fit better. But I actually recognized and noticed that performance, when I would point them out, right? When I would help direct the client and point them out, <clears throat> performance improvements were mm -hmm. actually more exciting <clears throat> for my clients. It almost was empowering for them. I think when, it's because they're more universal, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't matter if you just want to look good in a bikini or you just want to lose 50 pounds of fat or you just want to add 10 pounds of muscle. Universally, all those people would like to be stronger yeah. and they don't want to be weaker. Yeah. Right. So it's like, it's a common thread found in, or even somebody who's anti approaching it towards health, anti aging, you know, they're in advanced age. Well, yeah. Lack of mobility. Like all those people would agree. Like, yeah, I want to be stronger. Yeah. Like you've never hired. No like you unlock the new ability. Yeah. You know, a lot of times too, that's the case. Like somebody could never do a pull up before all of a sudden they can do a pull up. Like that's life changing for some people. That's, that's exactly what, what I, what I discovered was uh, the pursuit of learning a new skill or the pursuit of being able to do something you couldn't do before. There's nothing more empowering and motivating than that because, you know, I always talk about when I would train young, you know, teenagers and I, they do so many pushups and the next week they do two more pushups. And I would point out to them, you did two more pushups. I say, really? And I said, yeah, that means you're not the same person right. you were last week. That is an incredible, that's like transformative in a very objective way. Whereas, you know, maybe you lose weight, you know, you're 45 years old, you go in, you lose weight, but you know, I'll never look like I did when I was 20 or I'll never, but I just did something I could never do. I've never done a pull-up. I've never deadlifted this much weight. I've never been able to move in this way, uh, at like, uh, for the, for my entire life, or I've never been able to run a mile in this speed or whatever. Uh, I just found it to be the most empowering, motivating um, thing that uh, I could ever present to my clients. And that's, I think, the number one benefit. The second thing is PRs create purpose behind your training. Mm -hmm. So why are you showing up to the gym? Like everybody needs a purpose behind their training. And there's a lot of ways to do this. And I don't think this is the only way, but this is an easy way. It's a very simple way to create some purpose behind your training. Why are you showing up three days a week to the gym? I'm trying to deadlift more weight. I'm trying to add more reps to this, or I'm trying to improve my squat mobility. Um, it gets you to show up because, I mean, who wants to throw darts at nothing? Like you need a target. And yeah. when you have a target, uh, now you have something to aim for. And that in purpose, it, it goes above motivation because some days you're not going to be motivated, but you've got that goal, that purpose of why you want to show well, up. Yeah. I mean, not to be cliche, but if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Right. Yeah. And so it, it forces you to have a plan. You know, mm -hmm. you, you're not going to go get stronger at a movement, gain a new range of motion or do something like that without some sort of a plan of action. And it's the difference too, we've talked about this before, uh, of, of training versus exercising, right? Yeah. Like anybody can go exercise, running is exercise, jumping up and down is exercise, jump roping is exercise. Uh, training though is having a plan, having a goal in mind, and then building a routine uh, to uh, to hit that objective. Right, so I think that's important. Yeah, and, uh, and too, and I think it's unclear a lot of times if you don't have that um, something that you're you're trying to uh, strive for to see whether or not your training has been real effective or not, and to be able to really like measure that, weigh that out, like you know, my steps leading up to this uh, produced this result. And to be able to kind of look at that objectively, obviously, but but in comparison to just showing up to the gym and just training your body overall and just kind of going through the motions, um, you start to realize how much more effective your training gets, which then you can apply that then going forward. Totally. And then <clears throat> we've already said this, but it's hard to have poor health 
and hit PRs. Now, this isn't perfect. If you're always chasing the same PR, then you will sacrifice your health. Like if you're always aiming for max strength or always aiming for more endurance, then at some point you'll start to sacrifice health. But if you do it right, it's hard to have poor health and continue to improve performance. The body generally, and I'm speaking in a balanced way, generally speaking, does not improve its performance if your health is poor, generally speaking. So when we're talking about beginners, strength is a great one to aim for for beginners because there's so much upside and so little downside. As you get more advanced, it becomes a, a little more challenging. But in the beginning, for the first couple of years, uh, try to get stronger and, and miss nutrients in your diet or try to get stronger and have poor sleep or try to get stronger and have too much stress. <clears throat> it's hard. It's really, really hard. So Or poor digestion, right? So when you're seeing these objective uh, yourself progress objectively towards a specific type of PR, it's a better metric of health than the mirror is for sure. And definitely the scale. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one you touched on this just now, Justin, is that having a, a PR encourages proper programming. Mm -hmm. If I'm training specifically for a goal and that goal, I'm not moving towards that goal. I can modify my training and figure out what's working. And what I'm doing essentially is I'm feeling out proper programming rather than showing up and sweating mm -hmm. and getting sore. Now I can look at my workout and be like, my squat didn't improve this time or my mobility didn't improve. What is it that I did wrong? How can I change my, my training? It encourages uh, proper training. It discourages overtraining. It encourages uh, balance if you do in the, in the right way. And so for people listening who are not expert workout programmers, um, one way to kind of navigate your way through programming is to have a goal and then see how close you start to get to that goal and modify as you go along. Otherwise you're, you're walking in the dark and you don't know where you're, this where you're was going. the my favorite part of training these high school kids and taking them through the whole process of, um, you know, off season training to be able to then test that at the end and see how effective they were in applying these concepts and two, whether or not uh, the programming that led up to that was as effective as possible. And so it gave me a lot of good feedback and data to work with. Yeah. And you probably only have, I don't know, maybe the first year, maybe two that you can get away with newbie gains and have like subpar programming or be doing things correctly, let's say, and still see potential gains. Cause there, there is that early window, right? Where somebody, if you've never lifted weights before and you show up and you yeah. have terrible programming, but you show up and you start lifting weights, you're going to see initial strength. Let gains. me add to that though. Sure. Definitely true. However, you can definitely do a lot of things wrong and not make that happen. Oh yeah. In the beginning. Yeah. Oh, and you can also still uh, have done way better, right? That's yes, why it's yeah. a little, it's a little, it could be deceiving at the very beginning, I guess is what I'm saying is that you, you know, cause it's not always a perfectly clear indicator that, Oh, I'm following good programming. Right. Cause if I just started working yeah. out, just moving more is going to have a right. Like somebody who's hasn't trained, in decades and then they they follow a beach body program they're going to see strength gains yeah because yeah. they haven't done anything at any sort of movement in that direction it's going to have some positive return but it doesn't mean that <laughs> had they done it a different way or a better way they wouldn't have seen significantly more gains not to mention also set them up for more in the future so let's walk that through right uh because here's what i mean by the programming part let's say you're a beginner and you're right i mean if you almost do anything besides hurting yourself or really messing up you're going to see some progress because you went from the couch to doing something. Okay. So, so long as it's not crazy bad, you'll start to see some progress, but here's what'll for sure happen. It'll stop very quickly. If the programming is bad, You're, you'll plateau real hard. This is where proper programming gets encouraged. So let's say your goal is I want to be able to listen. I'll make up a goal. I want to squat twice my body weight in the next, by the end of the year. And I just get started. Well, at first I could have not that great programming and I'm going to add weight to the bar every week. Eventually I'm going to plateau though. And what's going to happen is I'm going to have, I'm going to have to analyze my workout. I'm going to have to look at what I'm doing. And if I'm, if I listen to my body and I'm really chasing this particular goal over time by myself through trial and error, I'm going to move more towards better programming and away from bad programming. So even with the person just getting started with the newbie gains, if they're consistent enough and they're honest and they listen to their body, they'll still be able to be like, okay, I know for the first three months I got stronger, I have stopped. Like I got to analyze my workout, what's going on. Now, people tend to make a lot of mistakes still. So they'll say, well, I got to do more. Usually the first thing that they do. But then eventually they'll start to realize that it's not about doing more. It's about doing things better. 
Of course, you can get around this trial and error period by following good programming right out the gates. But the point is having a PR encourages, if you're smart about it, uh, better programming and discourages uh, worse programming. Um, now, let's talk about when PRs can bad. go bad. Yeah. Mm. The most obvious one for me is when it's like just super myopic. Yep. Like I, I, It's just one PR. That's what I worship. That's what I obsess over. And that's what I aim for all the time, all the time, all the time. If you do that, you'll you'll start to train in very unbalanced ways. Yep. And you'll start, and you can and you will start to get a dramatic increase in risk of injury. And then the returns are, are not that great. Like when you first, like to use the example of the squat, when you first get started, the returns you get from adding 50 pounds to your squat are incredible. Like you, you take a beginner who's never worked out, you get them to learn how to squat properly. And then they add 50 pounds, the results and the feeling and everything they get is like, better mobility, faster metabolism, more muscle, they're leaner, they move better, they're faster. It's incredible. You take that same person four years later, let's say it's a 175 pound male and he can max out at, let's say 350, he's really strong. Adding 50 pounds to a squat is not going to give him all the returns he got initially. He's going to get a little bit from another 50 pounds on a squat, but what he's going to get a lot of is a dramatic increase in risk of injury and sacrificing things like mobility and pain and stamina and other things. So if it's always the same PR, it'll be okay at first, but then it'll start to. Yeah. I want to, I want to make sure that we have clarity around that by, by, by myopic, you mean very specific strength goal too, right? Cause yeah. like you can, you can have, you can pursue consistently strength goals and strength PRs and be totally okay. But it's the very specific, I want to get stronger at the deadlift or at the squat. Yeah, because, or just two exercises or just the big three. Yeah, right. Just so, And that's what I mean by specific. If it's specifically the same exercises, you're always pursuing PRs, that's where they get bad. There's nothing wrong with right now I'm chasing a squat PR and then next month I'm going to do a Turkish get-up PR. And then the next month, like picking movements that are going to to consistently benefit you by moving out of that same same plane or that same focus, I think that's okay. I think that's where you get in trouble is when it's the exact same. Now, to make it even more perfect, though, I would make this argument that at some point, it wouldn't just be max strength regardless. It could oh, be yeah. Like mobility I mean, in a perfect so, world. Yes. But what I want to make clear is like you could be pursuing basically- You could pursue strength, strength for a long time yeah, if and you be, balance and it. And be yeah. healthy and okay. Yeah. If, you're, if you're smart enough to understand that- the one of the greatest you know challenges or or problems that uh, occur from chasing just a squat PR is that it's the same movement, it's the same plane, it's the same like yeah. so it's and the hinges yeah, start the to get too repetitive pressure. stress. I mean, it adds up, and it, too, it's it's just you fall into patterns, and so like your body gets more efficient at these specific patterns, which is great for you know producing the amount of force to increase your strength, and so you know it, it can get addictive in that direction, but. Uh, if we're neglecting certain other types of movements that your body's fully capable of doing, um, and you're just prioritizing this continuous uh, direction of focus, uh, and, and your body's going to start, you know, uh, dampening that signal a bit in all those other directions to where um, it's going to start affecting now your overall body's performance, yeah. and, and it's going to start to actually work against you. Yeah, to give you an example, if I took a beginner, and then I took an advanced power lifter. And I, my goal was to make them both a lot stronger. And I did this for six months. The beginner would have all positives, all positives across the board. The experienced power lifter, I guarantee you would suffer from joint pain, mobility issues. And if I did succeed in getting them a lot stronger, they wouldn't have the dramatic in improvement in the quality of life that the beginner did because they're so already extreme in that direction. That's the point here. So if I took that power lifter and I'm looking for longevity, I would set a different kind of PR for them. Maybe strength in the lateral movement with rotation or maybe some stamina or ranges of motion for certain lifts or maybe something else, right? Yeah. That would be that would give them much more Just isometric contraction, yes. you know, something in that direction. Totally, totally. Wow. The second thing <laughs> is when your PRs go bad is when you start to sacrifice your health to chase a PR. So to use strength as an example, uh just eating way more food can get you stronger, but then you get into the, you know, those dudes like us in the gym, right? The perma bulk, right? The guy who's 38% body fat, still chasing five more pounds on his bench press. Yeah. You probably shouldn't. <laughs> I don't think that extra five pounds is worth 
what you're doing uh, to your body, right? Or endurance. I mean, I've trained some very extreme endurance athletes and, you know, shaving 30 seconds off their, you know, triathlon time or whatever. And I see the sacrifice that it places on their health um, in order to do so. So when you start to notice like, yeah, I'm better at this PR, but I don't feel better. I actually feel worse. Um, then it's probably time to switch PRs. Yeah, I imagine that's got to be pretty challenging for people to see uh, as that starts to tip over, right? Because yeah. I think you you become so focused on on that, whether it be stamina, whether it be strength or whatever that you're focusing on. And, mm. you know, do they have the self-awareness to go, you know, am I getting better or worse sleep? And are my joints hurting more today than they were six months ago? Or yeah. yeah, usually they wait till their body's screaming at them. That's how I feel. Yeah. I feel it's like a so I, I feel like even before it gets to the point of sacrificing health, just a good, healthy, balanced relationship is to recognize like, oh, I've been really focused on this. Yeah. Unless you're like and and always you always have to remember that when we communicate things like this, we're trying to communicate to the masses and the general population who just want to be overall healthier and stronger. Yeah. The, it, it's a complete exception to the rule when I'm speaking to a powerlifting athlete, yeah, right? Completely. So the things that we're, that's a sport, right? At that, yeah, and we, we highly competitive athletes, a different focus. Yes, right. It's not and, health. And, you're yeah, right. You are, you're, you're sacrificing health. So you have to understand that this, like, cause someone who's like a, a competitor is like, Oh, that's terrible advice. I'm never going to get that strong. Well, of course, cause you're a competitor. Like if you're, listening and you just want to be strong you just want to be healthy you're looking for longevity that that's where this conversation you have to understand that's where we're coming from and then speaking <laughs> to those people it's a i think it's just a good exercise to move and out move in and out of these prs all the time in fact as soon as you hit a pr in whatever it was you're chasing move on I think that's an easy, like, 100%, an yep. easy, you you get a new stamina goal. It's probably the boom. most simple way you can right. approach it. Yeah. Instead of staying there, it's like, good, awesome, you hit a PR. Now let's go for something else. You can come back there later on and revisit and see if you can continue to get another PR. But it, what happens is they hit a PR and they're like, oh, can, let's see what I do. And, I, and by the way, it's coming from experience. I'm very guilty of this too, right? Hit a big squat PR. I'm all excited. Yeah, go for like, it again. Yeah. Real low, let's see what I gotta do next week. You know, saying then it, and then like, oh, I get real close. I'm gonna try again. So, I think a good practice, a general rule, is when you're chasing a PR in any in in any category, that when you hit it, to then move into something else versus continuing in that same direction. Yeah, you know, the, the funny thing is, if you asked any high level athlete, uh, hey, are, are you like optimized? Like, is your health optimal right now? They'd all yeah. say no. They yeah. would tell you yeah. that. Uh, How does your body feel? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's all about performance. Yeah. They're they're not pictures uh, of health. Um, now, one other thing is they can go bad when this is all you ever train for. You always need a PR. You always need a goal, or you always need a competition. Then this can you can run into a problem. And what it looks like when it becomes a problem is this. And I used to get clients like this all the time. That if they didn't sign up for something, if they didn't have an event to train for, they couldn't work out. And it became, especially as you get older, uh, it could you could start to run into problems because as you get older, you may not be able to hit performance PRs at all anymore. Especially if you've been working out for years and years and years, then it can become uh, quite a challenge. So at some point, this is there's nothing wrong with what we're doing. We're talking about actually this is really good, but also at some point you also want to learn how to work out for the sake of doing so, for the enjoyment of doing so. This is more black belt level, you know, training longevity type of deal. Uh, but it's something to keep in mind if you're planning I, on doing this for the rest of your life. Hundred yeah. percent agree, and I would be completely depressed if I was just measuring PRs in all these like strength or fitness categories. I think I look at PR in uh, health, like the whole sphere. So, like a PR could be for me, like I spent this much time, quality time with my son. I spent this much time reading this week. Like, yeah, I think a, a, a really healthy way to approach this to where it's not just focused on my body, my strength. I mean, that is, that's a major aspect of health and obviously what we communicate a lot, but the, the sphere encompasses so much more than just that. When we talk about overall health and some of that can be meditation related, some of that can be recuperative type of therapies like hot and cold therapy. Some of that can be reading for personal growth. Some of that can be spending time with family and loved ones. So there's nothing wrong with saying and that. And to me, that's what I've learned to do is that's to, next level, to move it out of yeah. just what's going on with the weights in the gym. Because when you've done as much as a lot of us have done in that area, it's hard for me to 
see a better physique, a stronger body than what it's I've exponentially more difficult. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, I don't want to be depressed do. all the time that I can't have a PR there or I, I can't chase those things. It's like so. There's other aspects of my life that I want to be able to say that I can hit PRs in too, and I think that's a very healthy way to keep you know that mindset of setting a goal and a plan but then also understanding that it, it moves out beyond just the the weight room totally too. i had an experience with that uh relatively recently when i hit a new pr with the deadlift and afterwards i was like what did i benefit from hitting this new number and i said my ego there was nothing else there was nothing on my physique i didn't feel any better if anything i felt less mobile um, I, I didn't get better sleep. I wasn't a better dad or a better podcast or anything like that. And I'm like, okay, well I got an ego boost. Is that really worth it? Was that worth the risk? Um, and, uh, you know, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't train, uh, specifically for that. And so my PR goal changed. In fact, for me, my new PR goal is to work out less. Now that sounds funny, but for someone like myself, that's a damn good goal and probably going to be good for me. But just an example of the different types of PRs. In fact, we should go through some. So obviously you can make a PR anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. But let's go through some of the best ones that we have identified to be the best ones for most people to kind of cycle through, if you will. Mm. Now, the first one, uh, obvious, is max strength. How much you can lift. Yeah. That's this pretty one, straightforward. for the first three years of training, is going to pay you back incredible dividends. At least the first two years, but probably the first three years or so. If you do this right and you don't go crazy and all that stuff and you train to get stronger and stronger and stronger for a good two to three years, you're going to get a ton of return for chasing uh, strength. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't interrupt it with other things, but overall, if you, if that's your ultimate goal, it's the best possible thing you could train for for most p beginners from beginner to about three, you know year three. And I think the best uh, PR that complements that is to be chasing things like uh, mobility and range of motion. So if I'm somebody who's heavily focused on on the PR in the max strength thing, then one of the best ways to complement that would be also to interrupting that or including a range of motion <clears throat> and mobility type of PR or goal, I think. Yes, and that, in fact, is the next one, which yeah. is specifically just that, is can I improve – my control and depth of a squat or my overhead press, or can I rotate better? Or I could not perform a lateral lunge before. Can I get to the point where I can perform it? Then can I add weight to it? Um, it range of motion and mobility also can have negatives. You push that too far, then you get, you know, you can get joint issues. But for most people who work out with weights, this one almost always pays back good dividends. I, I don't know too many people who lift weights that overdo you know, proper range of motion. Well, it unlocks, training. yeah, other potential areas you can get stronger in, which then, you know, contributes back to the whole. And I think it, you know, the mobility part really highlights that in terms of like where there may be some deficiencies you didn't even realize. Uh, I don't have that kind of ability to produce force when I'm in this position. And that's why, you know, you know, within this lift, I'm seeing that uh, as a deficit. And, uh, you know, and another thing that's a deficit, which goes in right along to the next one uh, for me is like staving off fatigue. And so something that happens like within, you know, this pushing that max weight uh, and, I'm, and I'm getting to that point, I'm going through the reps, but maybe my reps aren't very high and I'm just really focused on generating as much force as possible, but I'm getting really tired uh, and, and that's something that I need to address. And this is what I'm actually working on currently. Yeah, no. And you made a great point too, which is that, that all of, first off, all of these will contribute to a better, healthier better looking physique and body. Okay. All of these, they work together. The other part of this is if your goal is to simply, uh, you know, be the best at a specific lift or whatever, then don't worry about what I'm about to say. And we already talked about that. But if your goal is to be amazing and also be injury free, feel good and have longevity with all of these, all of these contribute to each other. So, you know, you talked about stamina, we talked about mobility, strength. Like if you cycle through those, mm -hmm. You'll get stronger over time with less pain, less injury, and feel better. You'll yeah. get more stamina over time with less fatigue, less wear and tear. You'll get better ranges of motion and mobility over time with better control and strength with all of it. Um, so they all contribute to each other, uh, and they all, all of these will make you look 
better. So that's, and I, I say that because I know that's a selling point. And everybody listening right now is like, I want to look better. Well, if you if you go through these different PRs over time, you'll hit way yeah, less road the bumps. byproduct. Yeah, stamina was a good one because uh, this one was one that I uh, I could see for myself that I was because I love max strength or I've always loved max strength. Yeah, but when I got to the point where I could squat four hundred pounds. Uh, for one rep, but I couldn't do 225 for 10 without feeling like I'm going to throw up. Uh -huh. <laughs> then I knew like, all right, I got to work on my, I got to work on my stamina. Like there's something missing here. So stamina is your ability to do more reps. It's your ability to, you know, there's endurances in stamina. It's your ability to do more sets and more exercises. Like if you're that guy or girl who could show up hella strong, but by the end of the workout, everything's cut down by half. You might need to work on your on your stamina a little. Well, bit. it also helps to maintain with quality control in terms of like how you're performing the reps, uh, because if that does sneak in, sometimes it's a little bit more elusive, and you don't realize like I'm actually, you know, fatiguing my way through this, trying to maintain a good form and and uh, you know go through that uh, properly like I want to with like the best performance I can possibly produce. But like, if I have any inclination of fatigue, it's going to degrade. I would say that that is the number one cause of like form breakdown and technique is normally from fatigue. It's rarely somebody who is doing singles or max lifting. And there's a bit of an error in the, in the movement or mechanics. It's normally somebody super setting or deep into the, into the oh, workout yeah. Oh, yeah. or Rep number 15. Not, yeah, yeah. Not great rest the day before. And so they get sloppy and tired and they get fatigued. And then all of a sudden they, they, they're not uh, uh, contracting their, their core. They're not keeping their posture right. And they get, a, they slouch or get a little lazy because they get fatigued. And then the breakdown happens and then the injury happens. The, the I, direct enemy of technique and form is fatigue. Yeah. Nothing. Well, I don't care how great your form is. If you get fatigued enough, it's going to be crap. What do they say in boxing that, uh, you know, they talk about uh, heart, right? Boxer has heart. And coaches will tell you it's stamina. Mm -hmm. If you got stamina, you're going to have heart. If you get tired, your heart goes out the window yeah. type of deal. <laughs> yep. um, so that's true with uh, with your workout. The next one is stability. How stable are you? How tense can you be? Can you hold a weight above your head tight and strong? Think of uh, you know performers on stage holding each other up and you notice how strong and tight and, and stable they are. Can you carry a weight for distance? Uh, can you do it uh, offset? Maybe more weight in one hand than the other. And you can do that and hold yourself tight. Anybody who's ever lifted weights knows that being strong doesn't necessarily mean you have tremendous stability. I talk about this all the time. It's like new parents know this. You work out in the gym all the time. You're really strong. You hold your baby at the grocery store. You're like, why is my bicep tired? Mm -hmm. I curl 45 pound dumbbells and this 10 pound baby is, is making my arm. Oh, it's stability. It's that ability to just maintain that isometric contraction. Um, uh, you know, speaking of which isometrics and that kind of training is sorely lacking in modern programming. And it's unfortunate because it's one of the most effective, least damaging ways to exercise. In fact, I would say most people listening right now, if you did a, and you trained for a PR in stability, um, you would get tremendous, uh, payback because you probably never train that way. I'd say that's probably the one thing that most people don't even know how to train for. Yeah. But yet, ironically, I would say that this is where most of us started all of our programming. Like when you got a client, a new client, rarely ever did I right away jump to max PRs and strength. Like if I can't, if I can't get you to balance on one leg, mm -hmm. I'm certainly not going to, you know, load you, max load you bilaterally. I'm going to first get you to be able to stabilize on each, each leg individually by itself before I even think about loading like that. And so I think most of us, when we train clients, that was the foundation was stability first. Well, it's an immediate leak of performance right away if you are at all unstable. Uh, and then it's you're mo more prone to injury. And here, if the focus of this really is the longevity of your joints and the joint health. And so uh, in terms of all of the above, um, to be able to extend uh, your your ability to keep pursuing these PRs uh, is all you know banking off of like how stable you can create uh, around your joints uh, for longevity. Well, this is also the uh, unfortunate part about how the fitness space bastardized the stability training because uh, there was some value to totally. taking somebody who couldn't even balance on one leg to now maybe they could 
hop and then balance on a, on a BOSU ball and stabilize them without having to touch the ground. Like their ability to progress from the inability to do that on one leg to being able to, to hop and then stabilize, decelerate and all that uh, in one movement. Like that's, there is some value to that. I think that we took it to the extreme and then we began, everything became about that like we do with anything else. But there is some value to taking somebody who is very unstable like that, building that stability and having stability PRs first before chasing some of these big max PRs. Totally. Now, my favorite PR, and this different, this can you can you can modify this and change this. But my favorite is a consistency PR. You want to work out two days a week or three days a week. How long can you keep that string or that record? And the last time was three months. Yeah. Let me see if I can beat that. Let me see if I can do four months. Uh, here's another one. For those of you that are hyper consistent with your training, you think this is stupid, pick a segment of your training or something with your fitness that you negate. Maybe you're very consistent with your weights, but you're super inconsistent with your cardio or super inconsistent with mobility or super inconsistent with, I don't know, meditation. Well, now you can set a consistency PR goal with something like that. And all you got to do is do better than you did last time. So last time I did, you know, a week consistently. Now I'm going to aim for two weeks consistently. It's one of my favorites because yeah. it trains the most important thing with longevity, with exercise, which is just your ability to stay disciplined and consistent. Arguably the most uh, <clears throat> simple concept, but the hardest one out of all of them uh, I've found with with clients coming in to uh, to achieve, and and so this is a very very much of a mental discipline that uh, if we if we can master this one, all the rest you know you're gonna totally. have a lot easier time with. I mean, I I attribute this to all the success I had in bodybuilding, and the way it looked is exactly what you alluded to, which is, and I applied it both to nutrition. To even when I when I did introduce cardio to weight training and it was like okay, um, I haven't had seven days of perfect eating, and 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 like so the goal was eight days. You know, can I get to eight Love days? And once I pass eight days, maybe I went all the way to thirteen days and then I fell off again. Okay, and now fourteen days is the new the new goal, right? And I just kept doing that until I was able to string months of consistency around diet and training and exercise. And it's what made me keep progressing like that. And it's what I love about that is that you can meet anybody anywhere where they're at. Like, let's say you've never ate good for three days in a row. Like there's your first PR, like love it. hit yeah. four days and then you hit four days yep. and then extend it. And then just, and if you fall off, that's okay. You fell off on day seven. You know what your old PR was? Yeah. You know, now you're you're stretching yourself again. And it's just a great way to build those small wins to eventually building that consistent lifestyle to where it then turns into a habit. This was my favorite type of PR to teach my clients uh, to aim for early on because it, I could apply it to everything, not just exercise. Like you said, Adam, like, okay, your, your goal right now is – can you drink a half a gallon of water a day? And I want you to track it. And it's like, oh, you did great. Seven days in a row. Like, let's try and beat that next time. Um, and like you said, Justin, this one leads to all the others. Mm -hmm. So it's a great, and it's also a great way to take a break, by the way. Like if you've been pushing your body in all these different directions, I mean, you could say, okay, uh, you know, like for me, for example, my goal right now is to not do traditional strength training four days a week. I'm only going to do traditional strength training three days a week. So far, I've gotten three weeks under my belt. My goal is to be able to do this for the next, you know, maybe another nine weeks or so. And so it's kind of like, it sounds like a reverse goal, but for someone like me, I've identified this could be really valuable. All right, so here's what we did to help some of you out because obviously the, the ones we gave were somewhat vague, not necessarily specific. And so what we did is we created, this month we launched a new program called MAPS Old Time Strength. What was cool about this program were the, so a lot of the exercises and movements and techniques in there were things that we know people don't train anymore. We just know it's lost wisdom. They're just not exercises that people can even identify anymore, but they're super valuable. And so what we did is we said, we should come up with some challenges that people could try to accomplish that we think most people would benefit from. So we picked movements that a lot of people don't do. We also picked different types of PRs so that it's not just strength. We also picked one that was stamina and one that was the stability or the, um, you know, what we call grit. 
<clears throat> in this particular test. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what they are. You could you could train for these yourself, practice them. Another thing that we did with them is we put uh, guidelines on there so you're you can compete with other people if you want, which can kind of make it fun. So and it doesn't matter how much you weigh versus how much they weigh. It's all based off of uh, your body weight and stuff like that. And so here's what they are. Now, Doug, if you could put the formulas on there, that'd be great too. So I can give people percentage of body weight. But the first one is a strength challenge. And this is just typical how much max you can lift. And here's the lifts. And they're all different. You've probably never trained these before. One is a barbell single arm deadlift. The other one is a bar is a bent press. So this is an old school lift. The other one is a barbell hack squat. And you do it as a percentage of your body weight. That's what you're aiming for. Can I do more? Now, this is cool because if you get leaner and your weight don't, doesn't go up, you actually got stronger as a percentage of your body weight, which is kind of cool. Allow smaller people to compare, compete against uh, bigger people. So it's pretty cool. The next one is a stamina challenge, uh, which is, uh, and I need numbers for that too, Doug, where you're going to see how many reps you can do of a Hindu pushup or dive bomber pushup. Um, how many reps you could do with a front squat. Doug, get me those percentages so I can give them to them. And then how many reps you could do with what's called a seesaw press. A seesaw press is literally a shoulder press where each arm is pumping. With the front squat, it's half your body weight. How many reps can you do? And with the seesaw press, if you're female, 10% of your body weight in each arm. And if you're male, 15% of your body weight in each arm. And you're just looking at getting more reps, this total stamina. And then the stability one, which is, this one's kind of cool. It's my favorite one is you're going to look and see how long you can hold these lifts for. The first one is a is a dumbbell single arm overhead hold. And the weight that you're picking is if you're female, 30% of your body weight. If you're male, 50% of your body weight. The second one is a barbell suitcase hold. If you're female, it's 50% of your body weight and male, 70% of your body weight. And then the last one is how long you can hold your chin over the bar. For men, you have to pull yourself up. And for women, you can start at the top position and for this, it's just total time. Add up the total time with all of them. There you go. And if you train for each of these and cycle through them, you've got yourself some pretty damn good balance. I think most people would benefit from these. So. Yeah, I, each Absolutely. one of those challenges addresses the everything that we talked about from the stability to the, the max strength to mobility, range of motion, like yep. all the movements that are included in there. You get If you hit PRs Stamina. in those movements, you're going to see gains in all those other aspects. That's, yeah, it's amazing. By the way, if you want specific training for those lifts, the new program is called MAPS Old Time. It does train you specifically to be able to perform those. Because it's a brand new program, uh, it's a launch special. These are actually the final hours as this episode airs. So you can get it $80 off plus two ebooks for free Forgotten Muscle and Strength Building Secrets and Living a Fully Optimized Life. That was written by Jay Campbell. So you have to go to mapsoldtime.com, use the code OLD80, and you'll get uh, all of those uh, hookups. Also, if you want free information, okay, go to map, uh, mindpumpfree.com. We have fitness guides there that are all free. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. I'm on Instagram at Mind Pump DeStefano. And Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam.